Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Bill Maurice here from Mayo Clinic Laboratories, joining you for another Answers from the Lab podcast. Um, one of the really uh, uh, exciting things about uh, having a leadership role at Mayo Clinic Laboratories is our mission to bring advanced diagnostic capabilities out to patients and providers um, that need access to them to take care of their patients. And so I'm very excited, uh, have been excited to announce our collaboration with the company Progentech, which as you'll hear about here today, has some very innovative tests in an area of great need for patients with uh, systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE. And I'm joined today by uh, Drs. Monroe and Rubin. Um, Dr. Monroe is the Chief Scientific Officer and Principal Investigator at Progentech Diagnostics. And Dr. Rubin is the Chief Medical Officer at Progentech Diagnostics and also with great someone with great expertise in the care of these patients. So I'm, I'm very excited to be joined by both of you today. Um, what I'd like to delve into, um, we will also be talking with another provider that's using your tests. Um, but really today, I wanted to get more into the science of the test, kind of the, the, the science and the why of why the tests were developed. So I think starting with you, Dr. Monroe, I know that you um, have developed a couple of really innovative tests uh, designed for the management of patients with SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus. And maybe you could share with us a little bit about what they are um, and why they're significant. Sure, I'm gonna give just a smidge of background first. So we know that SLE or lupus, I'll probably use two terms interchangeably, is a systemic autoimmune disease that's caused by and driven by immune dysregulation. And so our goal is to develop tests that in, that encapture this immune dysregulation to um, inform clinically um, actionable algorithms to help providers and patients proactively manage their disease. So about 20 to 30% of lupus patients either have consistently active disease or consistently low or quiescent disease um, activity, and that's great. Um, but for the vast majority of patients, they tend to have a waxing and waning disease course, meaning that they'll have periods of heightened disease activity or even clinical disease flares that oftentimes um, puts them in the hospital, requires hospital treatment, or at the very least, high dose steroids to treat. Um, and that's offset by periods of more stable disease where they have relatively lower levels um, of disease activity. And the hard thing is that um, using our current clinical measures, we don't usually know when a flare is going to happen. But as we describe in our Journal of Autoimmunity paper from May 2022, um, our, we, our studies and other studies from our collaborators and other colleagues in rheumatology who study lupus have found that immune system changes that we can measure in the blood occur before clinical changes. And this happens either before a patient has a disease flare or before you or after you intervene with treatment. So if you intervene with treatment, either because they have active disease or they've had a disease flare, we can look at the immune system and see that the immune system is changing before we see the clinical changes. And we wanted to take advantage of that. And so our first test that we developed is called the lupus flare risk index. And what that does is that captures immune dysregulation associated with future disease activity that might result in a flare within the next 12 weeks and encapsulates that into a single uh, score through a proprietary algorithm um, that can tell us you if you have a high score that not only are you at a higher risk of having a disease flare in the next 12 weeks, you're at a higher risk of having a more severe flare. So the higher the score means higher risk and higher likelihood of uh, more severity. And so that would allow the provider and patient, um, if they end up with a high score, maybe the patient needs to be seen sooner rather than later with their rheumatologist and see if any changes need to be made to their treatment plan. 
Now we also see immune dysregulation, although a different um, combination of pathways that are affected that drive current ongoing disease activity that's happening today. And Progentact has worked to also encapsulate those changes into a single algorithm score called the Lupus Disease Activity Index. And it's good for a couple of patient populations. One, for patients that are seen quarterly or more frequently with their um, rheumatologist, they can use it to ca better characterize their disease activity. And because I said that immune changes happen before clinical changes, it, along with the flare risk index, can be used to see if patients are responding to treatment. Now, the disease activity index is particularly useful for patients who can't see the rheumatologist. Except some of them only see the rheumatologist every six to 12 months, and that might be just a little bit too long, but yet they are not really sure how frequently they should be seeing the rheumatologist. And so this test can help if they're taking it, having it done quarterly to see if they're at risk for heightened disease activity, and maybe they need to see their um, rheumatologist sooner rather than later. On the flip side, for patients who have consistently low disease activity and might want to withdraw or dose down some of their medication, especially those that are at risk for toxic side effects, um, this would allow patients and providers to carefully dose down their medication, but because they're still checking the immune system, either with the disease activity and or the lupus flare risk index, they can see if their immune system starting to ramp up and maybe they should start adding some more medication on before they have active disease or disease flare. So the ultimate goal is to proactively manage disease to prevent permanent organ damage. Got it. Wow. I Super exciting. So, um, you know, a couple of days. So first, when I was in medical school, which is now several decades ago, uh, immunology was like really confusing to me. So, of course, that's what I chose to get my PhD in. And I've actually been convinced for a long time that, that you know, people don't. And this came up, we really talked about during COVID. But, you know, our immune system is amazing. And it, it, it's tasked with identifying all the different thousands of potential pathogens that are out there and recognizing them and differentiating them from self, from normal or our normal tissues. And I've, and that's a, a, a process that can be to come in disturbed as it becomes in lupus, as you've described. So, but the challenge has always been, so we've known, and I've kind of thought for a long time that this is really going to be where diagnostics will go, will be in kind of being much more sophisticated in measuring the immune system, but the reality is it's very complex. And so I just wonder, I mean, you know, how were these tests developed? I mean, these really are groundbreaking. So what went in, you mentioned some algorithms, so, but how, what was behind the development of these tests? Well, let's talk about um, the flare risk index test first. And so um, I realized preparing for this podcast that this, um, Flare Risk Index has actually been over 10 years in the making. Um, it started initially with some retrospective studies with my colleagues at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, where we were just looking at um, what changes in the immune system happen before disease flare with the various cohorts that we had on hand in our biorepository. And this is where we first found that immune system changes happened before the clinical changes that le led up to disease flare. And these retrospective studies, if anybody's more interested for details, um, our first publication was in arthritis and rheumatology 10 years ago in 2014. Um, we had a follow-up uh, publication in the Journal of Autoimmunity in 2017, and then another publication in scientific reports in 2019. And the nice thing about all the findings in the retrospective studies is this is what's really launched um, Progentech and their studies to develop this clinically actionable flare risk index. And so what Progentech has done since taking over this technology is to um, actually use cohorts of patients from the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. The Mayo Clinic has been a great source of patients to follow, as well as other um, lupus providers. And we've been following patients prospectively. So they're um, clinically evaluated 
um, every three months, um, specifically for disease activity and flare. And so we have a very clinically um, data-driven rich source of samples to both develop and validate our flare risk index. And so um, this flare risk index, um, we looked at uh, 32 different mediators in patients who were going to have a flare in the next two we 12 weeks, sorry, quarterly, 12 weeks, um, versus um, either the same patients or a demographically comparable set of unique lupus patients who did not experience disease flare. Um, if you're going to try and predict flare, it's just as important to look at the non-flare population. And so we, we looked at the mediators, which ones best differentiate those two groups of people. And we found that there were a combination of 11 that best differentiated those two groups. And if we um, weighted them by what happens at their future uh, visit when they either have a flare or they're not flaring, what their disease activity looks like, that all informed the algorithm that gives us a single flare risk index score. Now, you could go positive, negative. If you're positive, you're more likely to have a flare. And if you're negative, you're less likely to have a flare. And that's all true. And we get really nice um, effects, large effect sizes from that. But that's, but for clinicians, they would like a little bit more granularity. And so we did um, it was a statistical um, evaluation called decision curve analysis. And basically that's uh, mathematically looking at your algorithm to see where would the appropriate cutoffs be where a clinician might be more likely to intervene. And so with that in mind, um, we have low risk, which um, gives us a maximum sensitivity of 97%. So if you're in the low risk group, you're far less likely to flare in the next 12 weeks. And then we have moderate risk, where you're a little bit more likely to, to um, flare in the next 12 weeks. And if you do flare, you're more likely to have a mild moderate flare if you're using the Salinas Lead Eye Flare Index. Um, and then there's the moderate high cutoff. And those who are in the high risk were not only at the highest risk of flaring with specificity of 98%, they were also the patients who ended up having severe flares. And so the higher your score, not only are you more higher risk, but you're more at uh, risk of how your severity of flare will, is also likely to be higher. Um, and so who is this useful for? This is useful for patients who've ever had a disease flare, we think that anybody who's ever had a history, if you are one of the lucky 20 to 30% that your disease is well managed and, and stable, we think that's wonderful. But for the 80, 70 to 80% of patients who are going to have a flare at least once, if not a multitude of times throughout their disease course, we think that all patients should be evaluated quarterly with this test um, to see what's going to happen in the next 12 weeks um, with your immune system and could it possibly be uh, driving a flare so that providers can possibly either change treatment plans um, or see if patients are actually being compliant with their treatment. Sometimes um, the side effects uh, patients don't want to take their treatment all the time, and that's actually one reason why some patients flare. Um, so providers can review um, what's going on with their patients clinically and how their treatment plan is going and if they need to make changes. And we would love if it would completely prevent flares, but at the very least, if we can diminish the flares or intervene early with something other than high dose steroids, we can prevent some toxicities so that down the line, we can prevent organ damage. Well, yeah, that well, that thank you for that. I mean, first of all, I think it really you really nicely lay out. It, it's one thing people read about a research study which shows something, but taking an observation made in the research setting and then the work to actually create a diagnostic that a, that a physician can use to have a conversation with a patient about their disease as a whole nother level of work that has to happen. Uh, clearly, this is complex, and you've you've done that work, and you've done the work to also say. How specific is the answer for that pay provider and that patient and and for that physician? And so, it, it's very helpful and very you know insightful. Uh, you know, I, Dr. Rubin, you're someone with a you know great depth of experience and knowledge in in both immunology and rheumatology and the care of of lupus patients. So, you know, can you just share from a, from your perspective why it's so important to measure both the the 
activity level as well as the risk of flare and how these answers that are these that a progen tech test might provide might be used by a physician caring for patients sure thank you very much um as dr monroe said uh these are incredibly well validated tests and i think the key point here is that the traditional tests that we as rheumatologists and other physicians have used to monitor lupus patients are unfortunately imprecise in the fact that the lab testing might be abnormal, but the patient is clinically doing fine, or the testing could demonstrate that the patient seems to be okay from a lab standpoint, but the patient has complaints. And so what this leads to in the clinical spectrum is a lot of frustrations between the patients uh, trying to express their concerns and get their needs met. And physicians are also frustrated because the traditional tests often don't reflect what the patients are telling them in the exam room. So these tests actually have the opportunity to validate the patient's concerns in an objective fashion, which allows physicians to then act on the test, not only am I taking my patients' complaints seriously, but I can show them and I can show myself and demonstrate to my peers that I have validated their complaints objectively so that there's an alignment between the lab and the patient's complaints uh, in the current sense. Then, as Dr. Monroe said, prospectively, now that I have the confidence in these tests, I can now say to my patient, I'm going to do your testing. Now, if you feel poorly in the next few weeks between now and our next visit, please let me know you've got to come in because this test indicates that you might actually be flaring and I would want to see you before your next regularly scheduled visit. So I think that it improves the what we call that shared decision making between patients and uh, healthcare providers, because this kind of testing is really very much uh, more precise, getting into what we call precision medicine, where it's really pinpoint to the patient and identifying and helping to solve uh, unmet needs that currently exist. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that term because that's exactly what I was thinking was, of course, it's particularly pre-pandemic, but now kind of as we've emerged, you know, precision medicine was all the buzz, which of course is a focus on diagnostics, but most often that was talked about in the term, in the, in the setting of oncology and cancer diagnostics and advanced genetic testing on tumor. And yet, you know, the testing that, you know, prior to Progentech introducing these innovations, the testing that was used in the management of lupus patients, I think, were the same tests that I was taught about back in medical school 20 plus years ago. Right. Um, and so this really does represent an advancement of the laboratory being able to to create new capabilities to provide insights to patients and the physicians that are actionable and meaningful. So I guess the other the, you know question then is, you know, how does availability of this test really impact uh, the life of a patient living with lupus? Well, I think the I think the quality of life of patients with lupus would be incredibly improved because now you have a test which not only, as Dr. Monroe said, measures current disease activity when uh, either a therapeutic change is made or anticipated and, and validates, validates the patient's uh, perceptions of how they're doing. I think I'm doing well, doctor, and my lab test shows that. So I feel confident that when I talk to you and you do this test, that there is an alignment. And then more importantly, this risk index, the patient says, I'm comfortable coming in quarterly to see you, doctor, or maybe less often, because you're going to be doing this test and you will know ahead of time if I am at risk for a flare of my disease. I don't have to be on pins and needles. I understand that your testing and the testing will help to identify that increased risk. And I think that will allow patients to live their lives in between visits with the comfort of knowing that they can be monitored more effectively. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And going back to precision medicine, and Dr. Monroe touched on this as well, is to think about, uh, again, the treatments for patients that are in active disease, uh, you know, are and are suffering from a flare, they're not benign therapies. They have, they have, they have side effects as well. So they need to be used judiciously. The challenge is, you know, for the three of us here thinking about the immune system and how it's designed to operate is that once it gears up for a challenge, it, it gears up and you and then it's a little bit like a runaway train. You you want that if you're infected with a pathogen that it, the immune system can can gear up very quickly and eradicate that pathogen. But when the immune system's you know inappropriately recognizing your body as abnormal, unfortunately, the way that we manage that or identified that was by looking for signs of end organ damage in the laboratory and then having mm -hmm. to inter try and intervene. And my sense is that these sorts of tests will now allow you as someone seeing a patient to not only give them the peace of mind, them the peace of mind, but it's also you the peace of mind to say, I need to be treating now. I can treat earlier and hopefully not have such a prolonged co course of steroids or whatever immunosuppressant might be used. That's my, my sense. Is that accurate? Yes, I think, uh, uh, and this might be a shared feeling between both you and Dr. Monroe, but patients would often come and say, I remember a couple of years ago that I really felt poorly when my lupus was active. And I know I'm on a lot of medicine, but I'm afraid to taper. I'm afraid to take less because I don't want to feel like I did six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. But now with these tests, we have the ability to say, I'm monitoring your disease. We can monitor it together. We will be able to taper your medicine and we can follow these lab tests so that we won't let you get back to where you were before. We can proactively prevent that flare. We can manage you more intelligently, but not allow you to have side effects from an overuse of medications that may be unnecessary. Yeah, no, it's really exciting. I mean, this is why it's it's both gratifying and humbling to be able to work with Progentech as Mayo Clinic Laboratories, because uh, the ultimate goal is uh, for me as a laboratory medicine professional and for Dr. Milman, for all of us, is to figure out and to, to you know, find ways that the clinical laboratory can actually make more of an impact in an individual's life and hopefully change the course, you know, because I know patients with lupus have tend to have poor outcomes and it can affect younger patients. And can we meaningfully change their lives? If you, as you've described is, is extraordinarily gratifying. And so I'm very excited personally to be working with Progentech and with, with both of you um, and also to continue that collaboration, because one of the things that's interesting about the laboratory Again, going back to my PhD, I remember my thesis mentor told me that, you know, when a successful experiment produces more work because it gives you more things that you have to study. And I think that the same will be true here is that as we get better tests to, to, to manage and diagnose patients with lupus, we'll recognize new needs for diagnostic insights that companies like you know, which Progentech will pursue and that we'll have the, the privilege of working with you on. So I want to thank you both for your time today. It's It's been really helpful to me and really informative. I hope people listen. We'll have links um, so our listeners can find out more about Progentech and more about your tests and how to use them clinically. Um, and so I look forward to talking again in the future about the, the other great innovations that I'm sure you'll have in helping with the management of these patients. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.